Lord, we're so grateful to you for all your goodness to us. We thank you for this process of equipping. We thank you for the students who you've brought together, for all of us who are sitting at your feet to be students of your will for our lives. And we pray now that this time of learning will be a time of alertness, a time of assimilation, a time of personal growth. And that all that we should have learned will be used to your honor and to your glory. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, I don't need to, to introduce to you your speaker this evening. So over to you, Brad. We just get ready to hear what God has blessed you with for us this evening. So, Yvonne, I'm going to pull a little bit of a trick on you here. So you've heard this how many, 20 times, whatever. So if you had to think about how spiritual formation fits giftedness, how would you describe that? How would you introduce that topic in terms of how what we're talking about tonight is spiritual formation is connected to understanding giftedness and calling. Wow. I'm going to take it down to personal assessment, yeah. right? Yeah. And I understand that my giftedness, and I particularly, can I use an illustration? Sure. I love to sing. And growing up, I was always the guest soloist of some sort. Along the way, I was in the middle of a church service when I was asked by the pastor. He stopped the congregation from singing and asked me alone to sing that one verse of the song. And it said, take my voice and let me sing, always only for my king. Take my intellect and use every power as thou should choose. The act of singing that brought me to a place where my giftedness and its purpose changed. I recognize at that point more than ever Ever, that my giftedness carried a weight. I could have used it in ways that I grow more spiritually connected to God and see it as his using that gift to widen, to serve his kingdom, or I, and take myself and my abilities back to the back. And so when I answer that question, I answer it from the perspective that my giftedness is almost the weight or the burden of making sure that I understand it in the context of God using me as a vessel too. And so I need to listen to him I need to understand that it is not enhanced by how I am holier than thou or what rituals that I perform, whether it be um, singing or whatever, but more so how it is drawing me closer to God, how I am understanding God's purpose and call on my life and how I am growing in my my relationship with god am i making sense Good. well that's helpful and then what you're you're talking about is how spiritual formation by understanding our gifts it gives us somewhat of a of a good handle on how we worship god uniquely and so essentially, uh, the best way to worship God is through the gifts he's given us. And the more we understand that, the more uniquely we approach God through how God wired us. I mean, it makes sense that if God wired us a certain way, he would want us to, to, to worship him that way. 
you know, it's Gary Thompson. Did y'all do the Gary Thompson spiritual pathways at all in this class? It's the book spiritual pathways assessment. Y'all did not do that yet or have you? Yeah. So it's a, it's some of the courses will do that, but it's just, it's one way. There's so many different ways to do that where it basically is a, it's an assessment called uh, sacred pathways. Uh, it's the name of the book. It has uh, seven different ways that, um, are, and again, it's, we all, we worship, God in seven billion different ways, but it's just categories. And it talks about some people are naturalists and they worship God the most when they're in nature and just really respond to nature. Some people are more aesthetic where they worship God by narrowing things down and being very simple. Some people really find that they worship and connect with God more through intellectual exercise, others through tradition, just going through rituals and tradition. And it's just uh, one way to think about temperaments is the way he does it, giftedness, and how we can, without apologies, say we worship God with a unique style and a unique set of gifts because God wired us that way. Um, and so that's, we pursue that. And like, like Yvonne said, there's a weight of stewardship. If God has given you a beautiful voice, then uh, you have a weight of stewardship and a delight of stewardship to use that as a way to lead other people to trust God in new ways. Um, and so that's, that's part of how giftedness and calling connects to spiritual formation. But I'm going to back up a little bit and just talk about the definition of spiritual formation and, um, and just kind of play with that just a little bit. So back in the mid-80s, um, I was asked to, uh, <clears throat> to develop a spiritual formation program at Dallas Theological Seminary, which is uh, one of the larger seminaries in, in, the, in the world. And so I said, okay, and the, the president had asked me to do this. I was um, a student that was just finishing up and was going to work there. Um, so I went and we had a meeting with the president and some others. And I said, okay, so I'm supposed to develop a spiritual formation program. What is spiritual formation? And they all kind of looked at each other and said, we're not sure. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of definitions out there. What we do want is a discipleship program. However, in our culture, the word discipleship has become to mean going through a workbook and filling in the blanks. And we know that's not discipleship. It's really following Christ, not just with our heads, not just with our actions, but also with our hearts. And because of that, a wonderful word, discipleship, has been um, kind of put aside or at least more narrowly defined. And sometimes when you work with a word that people think that they know, it's hard for them to get past those stereotypes. So I said, okay. And so they said, but we, we know spiritual formation is a better way to describe it. We just don't know. It's not been part of the Protestant uh, tradition. So I did some research and came back and said, okay, um, it apparently is part of the Catholic tradition. And so do I have permission to go have a Catholic spiritual director? And they said, um, yes, but don't tell anybody because there's some people on our campus at that time period, this is the 80s, that are nervous about Catholicism. And so we don't want to do that. So I went and had a Catholic spiritual director, and I said, I'm a Protestant. I'm trying to discern a little bit more about spiritual formation, and so uh, I really don't want to do the beads, and I don't want to do uh, the pray prayers to Mary, but I'd like to learn what y'all have learned over centuries. And he said, that's okay. So every single week, I would go and meet with the Catholic spiritual director, and he was it was like a counseling session. He would say, first thing we start with is the discipline of confession. So confess to me some of the things that have happened this week, and I would confess that. And he wasn't shaming. He would just listen and talk about it and interact with me. And then uh, just talk about kind of my view of God, talk about my, my family background a little bit, and that was when the hour was over. So one day I came, and I can't remember the sin, but it was a little bit bigger sin than normal. I confessed it, and he says, okay, that's a little bigger sin than normal. So what did you do with that sin? And I said, well, uh, my background, of course, is when you sin, you don't want to be out of step with the Holy Spirit. And so as fast as you can and as serious as you can, you go to 1 John 1, 9, where it says, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins uh, if we confess them. And so I confess them knowing and trusting that he's forgiven me of my sins. And he goes, so what did you do? Well, I really fast, went and confessed my sins to God and as fast as I could and as sincere as I could because I don't want to be out of step with the Holy Spirit, because if I'm out of step with the Holy Spirit, then I'll sin more. I want to be in connection with the Holy Spirit. He goes, okay. And then I drew him what back then was called Campus Crusade, had a, a spirit booklet, and it had a, a circle, and it had a throne in the middle. And it says if you put 
Jesus on the throne, all the little the inside circle things are all perfectly aligned. But if you take Jesus off the throne, then it all gets all messed up. And so the idea is, I said, I want to put Jesus back on the throne. And he said, wow, that's a lot of work. Uh, what a waste of a big sin. And I thought, okay, what does that mean? And he goes, you just wasted a big sin. And I said, okay, so how would you do it differently? And he says, you know, you, you uh, Protestants accuse us of salvation by works. And I understand where that's coming from. And the Catholic Church is, um, has a lot of right in it. But if that's not sanctification by works, I'm not sure what, what is. And he says, next time, I don't want you to go to 1 John 1, 9. He said, okay. What I want you to do is sit when you've sinned and not go confess it. But I want you to imagine the look of God's face and what he's seeing in you and how he's looking at you. And I want you to realize that Romans 8 says you are a fully adopted heir with Jesus Christ. There is no condemnation and nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. And so my assumption is probably when you're looking at his visage, he's probably all frowning at you or he's just disgusted with you or busy and goes, you know, why are you bothering me? He goes, but that's really not true. That's a wrong narrative in your head. You have adopted the story that's false. It's not biblical and it's false. It comes from your parenting. Your dad perhaps was like that. What I want you to do without confessing the sin, without going to 1 John 1, 9, just receive God's image. Receive what he must be looking at you like. And when you see his delight, that he delights in you because you are his child. He made you his child. Nothing you've done. Only then that you've received and just really hear and can picture just his delight in you. You'll read over Romans 8. He gave me a bunch of passages to read over. And then finally, when you receive his delight, wow, God delights in me. Not because of anything you've done. Then you can go to 1 John 1, 9. Now you're responding to what he's already done. You're not trying to create something uh, on your own that basically is, is what he's already done for you. And so the idea behind spiritual formation is, is not all the activities you do, it's receiving what God has already done for you. And that is the essence of spiritual formation. And um, the, another way we look at it is we would say, um, I don't have my diagram, but we can figure it out. So let's say that, you know, we see if kind of God's over here and we're over here and we go, I would like to draw near to God. And so therefore, if I pray a little bit more and I go to church and I read the Bible and I maybe take a Lecto Divina, I take a day of silent retreat, a little more Lecto Divina, a little more spiritual formation, more reading, more Bible. Through those activities, I draw closer to God. And I've always pictured it that way. But under the way that he was describing, he would say, every time you think one of your activities is drawing closer to God, that activity is actually an act of rebellion and an act of distrust of God. Because in reality, you are already in the Trinity, uh, adopt, follow a fellow adopted heir with Jesus Christ. So there's nothing you can do to get a closer position because God has already done everything. And so when you pray, it's not to draw closer to God, it's to recognize what God has already done. When you go to church, it's not to draw closer to God, it's to recognize the closeness that God has already given you. And so spiritual formation is really about recognizing what God has already done and trusting his character. Every time you do this, you're actually saying, God, I know you promised that I'm a fellow heir with you, with, with Jesus Christ. I know you promised that there's no condemnation, but I don't believe you. I'm cynical and skeptical about your words and your character. So therefore, I have to add all these other things to it. And that's very much what Adam and Eve did. When Satan came to them and they said, has not God told you you cannot eat of the garden? And they said, no, we can eat of the garden. We just, this one tree. And he says, yeah, but God doesn't have your best interest in mind. He knows that if you eat this one fruit, you will be wise like God. God's holding out on you. There is something wrong with God's character. He is not good towards you. And so the original sin was actually a skepticism created by Satan but that the, the original uh, Adam and Eve believed to say, I am skeptical of God's character. And I would argue that every one of us is born as a fallen creature, born with a, a sin nature, that at its essence is a cynicism or a skepticism or a doubt about God's character. Now we go to church, 
We learn in our heads, God is good. I have no doubt about God's character in my head. But yet every time I sin, that says something in my heart has not believed what my head has ascended to. There's something in the narrative of how, what I believe about God, we'll talk a little bit more about that, that is not agreeing with what I have learned and agreed to in my head in the Bible. And yet when I sin, I'm saying, God, I don't think your way is as good as my way. I don't think you have your be- my best interest in mind. I think I have my best interest in mind. God, I'm cynical and skeptical. Even when we use spiritual formation activities, prayer, going to church, silent retreats, and we're saying to God, I'm using this to get closer to you, we're in some ways saying, God, I don't trust you. So the very act of prayer can be an act of rebellion because it's enforcing a cynicism about God's character that he hasn't fully adopted us as his fellow heirs with Jesus Christ, and there's no condemnation. So that's a lot to cover right there. So let's stop about that. So the the, the definition of spiritual formation, how would you, and you're welcome to disagree. You're welcome to, often it's the disagreements that help us clarify it even better. Um, how would you state that differently? How would you disagree? How would you state it better? How would you affirm that? What do you think about what I just shared in terms of the definition of spiritual formation and how spiritual formation activities can actually be misused as uh, legalistic rebellion? Andrew, you turned off your mic, so you look like you're ready to You turned on your mic, you look like you're ready to go. What do you think, Andrew? Brad, you might just be the first person I have ever heard in 50 years to say what you just said. Okay. I, Is that I, bad or good, or are you about to turn off well, the camera and go? go that's, to- in, that's incredible because it's what I believe and have experienced. And when I say that to people, they look at me like I've just come from some other planet. <laughs> well, we can, you have, but that's all right. I'll tell you how, how I discovered. Yeah, well, I, I did come from another planet, but I, I'll tell you a story. I, uh, many years ago, my son, who's 16 now, was, uh, was about five, and so probably 11 years ago. We had bought this property that, that we currently live on, and it was a hot summer day, and my kids were doing something, and they just frustrated the heck out of me. And so I, the way that I dealt with that was by getting really angry and yelling at them. And my little five-year-old comes walking up to me, and he says, Daddy, it, it really doesn't help if you get angry. It just makes things worse. So, Wise. you know, which when your five-year-old tells you off like that, <laughs> um, the, the place I went was shame um, because I knew he was right and I couldn't spiritual for me for a walk to this little canal irrigation canal behind a, behind a property here and I sat up there and I found myself uh just sitting with God and I felt like a little child in in the fetal position just looking up in his face does anybody love me just for who I am and I look into his face and I'm expecting that frown I'm expecting that shaking head come on Andrew can't you get it right you know you should know better yeah and I look in his face and, and I just see the smile and the look of delight on So Andrew, we're experiencing your, your bandwidth is a little bit low. I'm not talking about your spiritual bandwidth, but your, your internet. So we're not hearing it all. So Andrew, I think the internet's not working real good right now in, in Washington State where you're at. Uh, we seem to have lost him. He may come back on, but Andrew, if you're hearing us, if you probably take your your picture down, yes, he's gone. He may come back on better. So anybody else? Concerns, affirmations, way to state it differently? 
story. Um, yeah, I'll jump in here. <laughs> um, I've always um, thought of spiritual formation as um, growing and you finding strength um, in the sins that you commit because um, what Satan is is an ad adversary. He, he goes, he, he was basically created to um, go throughout the earth and tempt mankind, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a good thing because the sins and the temptation that stand in your way, you overcome them um, through repentance and you, you repent, you do Teshiva and you repent, you turn the other way and you, um, and you keep going. And, um, and then that makes you a stronger person. And through that um, is what I was taught. That's how you can build yourself up spiritually is just by overcoming that sin and um, through teshuva, which is repentance, um, and that's just getting up and keeping on going. Um, um, and uh, of course, you know, asking for forgiveness, um, knowing that God is, of course, is going to forgive you because He's a forgiving God. And um, but you know, He brings that into your life for a reason to make you who you are and to strengthen you. And that's what I've been taught. Is there, and there's nothing wrong with repentance, my goodness, that's, but it may be the definition is needing clarification. So is repentance a ha an act of heroism, being a hero of a human, or is repentance acknowledging that God is good and, and to some degree we are, we are not God? And so it's really that definition of repentance. Is repentance our heroic act, or is it recognizing who God is? I think it's kind of both. Yeah. Um, you recognize who God is. That's what brings you to repentance. You know, you know, you've just, you've done something wrong. I mean, you, um, through the knowledge of the sin that, you know, you know, you've done wrong and you, you acknowledge God and who he is and, and he's your father. You go say, father, I'm sorry. You know, I'm, I'm going to, um, overcome this and I'm going to keep walking and keep going. And, um, through that, then you become stronger. And it's, um, I think it's just a, the point of this, though, is I, there's nothing wrong with disciplines and repentance. It's going back to how we receive God's love. And so maybe the emphasis tonight is more on that one aspect of receiving God's love, because everything you said is, is wonderful. But sometimes we get mixed up uh, what we have to do. And sometimes that doesn't allow us to fully receive what God has already done. And I think that's the point of spiritual formation. Um, but we still have to, there are still things we're called to do. And those are important things. But in some ways, the things we're called to do are really designed to help us to receive God's love. They, they really work together. Uh, it's when, and I grew up in a more of a legalistic background. So it's when I start focusing on what I have done and all the things I need to do and all the things I must do in order to earn God's favor, that's when it really turns into something that's not spiritual formation. And in some ways, it's really an act of rebellion. And so there's a, there's a line there. What you described is not that, but I know there's a line for all of us of what does that really mean? Yeah, faith without works is dead, um, is, is what it says um, in the New Testament writings. But it's also, there's also examples all throughout the Bible of, you know, um, what you do for God is important too. You know, you just can't say, well, God loves me. I don't have to do anything. You know, um, it's, it's really important that, um, that you do, you know, uh, worship God through, through, you know, what you're called to do and you, and you do good and you obey his laws. And I, and I truly believe that, you know, obeying his laws is it's still relevant to us today and we should obey god you know we don't need to murder lie steal or any of that stuff and so and then when we do those things of course we need to repent for those and we need to overcome those and keep going and then those things just make us a stronger person after we overcome them and so that's that's what i'm learning that's what i've learned okay and I think what I'm emphasizing is, is that, but it's also 
what makes us a stronger person is trusting God more. And so if we have better disciplines and we trust God more, we're a stronger person. If we have better disciplines and we trust our disciplines more, actually we're not a stronger person. We may look that way, but we end up really building our hope on a false thing. And that's the point. That's the point. And, uh, both well, yeah, are- of course. Yeah, yeah, God is always the strongest one. And and it's always good to trust him and that we know that he's 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 good for forgiveness and he's there for us and and he's like a father to us and and it's good to trust him but um he he doesn't want us to be weak he wants us to be strong and that's why our our lives on earth is here i mean we are here um you know not not to just play around we're here to be strong to to build ourselves up and um to be strong and so that's that's why we have that's why we have sin in our lives is to build us up and to make us stronger people. But um, God doesn't want us to just stay in our weak little state. He wants us to be strong, strong people. So Andrew, we lost. Thank you, Wendy, for sharing that. And Andrew, we lost the internet um, when you were talking about sitting on the irrigation channel and yeah. talking to God. Give, finish that out. And I apologize that we. Oh, we sorry. I, I realized my I was connected to the wrong Wi-Fi here. So, um, you know, just listening to what Wendy was just saying, I, I, I also grew up in a legalistic background and, and, you know, you had to work really hard to, to get it all right and do all those things. And I think what that, that experience opened up for me is a whole, a whole new journey into understanding what, the good news of the gospel is. And the good news of the gospel is I don't have to do anything anymore. Jesus did it. And so I live my life out of a response to that. Um, that what God is taking, taking me back to is the place that Adam and Eve lived in the garden, which was a life of, of dependency on God. Um, just, I guess maybe the best way to look at it is how is how Jesus lived. He he walked through life going, I don't say my own words, I say what the Father is saying. I don't do my own works, I do what the Father is doing. Um, and so for me that's what that's what I feel like um is is so capturing my heart right now is what does it mean to to live under the sound of his voice Mm -hmm. what does it mean to live um out of what jesus did not to get what jesus did Mm -hmm. that there's nothing i can do ever that will separate me from him there's nothing that i can do at all it's jesus paid for all that The, the way is open and so um, I, I just have, I don't know, there's, there's something in my spirit that just, I feel like a little child who has, who has this growing trust in his daddy that, um, you know, what, he, he just knows everything. And he, and he knows he, he, when I'm weak, that's where I go. I don't want to be strong because he is my strength. Um, to me, trying to be strong is about independence from him. And what I sense him calling me to to more and more is more dependence, more connection, more constant conversation, more constant sense of uh, my posture is just this. He's so wanting to pour out on me what I need to, to be who he's made me to be that if I'm trying so hard to do it on my own and figure it out on my own, um, I'm losing out on the fact that he's just sitting there with all the resources I need waiting to pour them out on me. Um, yeah, I don't know how else to describe it. It's just to get to a point where I'm stopping trying so hard to be good enough, trying to earn his love, trying to, obey all the rules and get it all right. Um, but living out of a place of where that's not necessary anymore. That's good. Independence and trust are the central things. 
it doesn't mean that discipline shouldn't be a part of it. But if discipline is bigger than dependence and trust, then we've, we've gotten it backwards. Yeah, I think what I'm finding, having walked away from all of my quiet times and the so-called spiritual disciplines, because I did all those things and it didn't change a darn thing in me. Sure. Um, so I walked away from all of that. And, and I find now, and this has been a 10, 11 year journey, I find now a new place where, where I feel him, him calling me back to those things but in a completely different way. I think that's a powerful way to say it. Really. And I don't know, this, this is still, honestly, this has just started to happen in the last two weeks. That's good. Where I sense, wow, I would like to spend more time quiet. I would like to spend more time solo. I'd like to spend more time just taking a word and meditating on it. I would like to take more time and actually uh, do some of those spiritual disciplines. I don't know about the fasting thing, because that never worked really well for me, but we'll see, we'll get there. Um, and there's this longing in my heart to go there, but I keep saying, oh God, I've been there before, but it wasn't a great experience. So what do you want, what do you, what do you want to do now? What are you teaching me? What are you calling me to? It's a, it's a whole different place than I ever was before. Because what I was taught that to be close to God, you got to do all these things. Well, I feel close to him. And now I'm experiencing him calling me to, to go back there again. I'm like, oh, this is weird. But good, you know. But as you do those things, hopefully it'll be, wow, I'm, re I'm receiving the closeness I already have. Right. The joy is, is I like that. I like receiving that. I like that reality. Yeah. So I want to do these things because they do help me to learn to receive that reality that's already there. Yeah, well, it's a totally different reason. I've discovered his closeness without those things. Mm -hmm. And I know that those things help, mm -hmm. uh, help me experience that more. His closeness is a reality whether you do those things or not. Exactly. Yeah. But yet doing those things sometimes can help. Yeah. Very powerful ways. Brad, I'm hearing two things coming out of Andrew's conversation that is resonating with me. Communion. It's a good word. Communion and grace. Two things that I know I, I struggled to, to understand and to experience. And I feel I can identify with what you're saying because now I'm at a place where it is not whether, did I miss my devotions this morning? Or somebody said, in my quiet time, I did this. And I said, oh my God, everybody else is having that quiet time. I didn't have it. But more that, I am feeling that throughout the day, amidst all of what was pouring in and out and around me in the day, I am in this direct, indirect conversation. And it is central to every pain, every foolish thought, every... And so I am measuring my response based on how he is drawing me to understand his grace, to understand his commitment and relationship with me, and not to let me determine my closeness to him based on me but based on what he says he is, which I struggle to believe. I struggle to believe that he's not tired of me worrying. When he told me umpteen times not to worry. But this communion is making me say to him, help me here. Daddy, help me, lift me to that place you want me to be. Um, understanding grace, we don't grow up in a culture that 
emphasizes understanding grace we we tend to more think that grace will only come under certain conditions when grace is unconditional i don't know if i'm you know getting there but 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 that's what is coming grace understanding grace and getting to a place of communion and relationship thank you how would others describe either as you've heard this conversation about spiritual formation and thank you Yvonne, i think grace is key how would you describe things that you might say i agree with i don't agree with i balance it out this way here's my story spiritual formation how do you, what's the essence of it? What's the point of it? How would you, how would you answer that? I'm uh, Noel here. Um, I want to answer it from this standpoint, going back to the scripture that um, Apostle Paul would have written in Romans 5 and 8, that it is love um, to us while we were yet sinners. And I, I think uh, that's the very foundation from which we ought to look uh, or take bearing for our spiritual formation. Um, what you would have said and some of the analogy that says that we still have to do some things but um, the caution is we shouldn't go overboard trying in order to please God because he has already done for us. Even before we realize that we want to come to him and the operative word there are sinners. While we were yet sinners, we were far away from him and he loved us. Yes. And now that we would have repented and come to love is still there for us. And therefore, I think the reliance that I'm hearing coming out from the conversation, we have to come on him because he is and continue to be the author and finisher of our faith and our life. I think truly understand that then whatever we do in worship, whatever we do with our gifts, whatever we do with our prayer, would be not to, 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 to make ourselves, but to say thank you for what he has done for you. So that's my contribution. So no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push a question, and uh, you don't have to answer this. Uh, with your background and maturity, you know the Bible very well. And you probably can do spiritual formation activities, uh, preach, talk, display very well. So you, like some of us that grew up in the church, have a unique temptation, I do as well, to start thinking, my, since I'm better at preaching perhaps, or better at spiritual disciplines, that that's really where my hope is, because I look around me and I go, well, I'm better than other people, because I grew up that way. What do you do with that temptation? How do you avoid falling into that temptation, knowing that you're no, good at it? I'm happy but it's not the internet, point. Yes, internet, internet um, interruptions. We are doing some upgrade in Guyana, and so it will go every now and again. Sure. So I didn't hear the question. So the question is: You have learned how to be good at at church activities, and uh, and you have that. You know the Bible, and so the question would be: Is how do you avoid putting your trust in that as you look around and you say, I'm better than most people at these things. How do you not, how do you avoid putting your trust in those things? Because it really is not the point. But yet that is a temptation if you're good at spiritual activities. How do you avoid it? How do you fight it? We may have lost no. Okay, so I've asked him a hard question. Here we go. <laughs> okay, he's back. All right. Yeah. Well, um, I think I got the last part of the question. How do you avoid putting trust in the activities that you do? Um, I 
we become too self-opinated and if we who show off and what you're doing is not actually to please God but to hear what man I think Noel is frozen again. I think we got the gist of your answer, um, but it's always something we always have to ask, especially if we grew up in the church, and um, it ends up being a, a problem, a temptation. Yeah, but it's good growing well, up. In the church, it a problem. No. I'm getting these interruptions. It's so terrible now, and and so um, it is. It is not how, how well you do it that you get a from what man is saying when, or a pastor who visits you. But it's how your heart feel as you try to relate what God is saying to you. Yeah. Good. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Anybody else? Mr. I, I so agree with that. I agree that your heart towards God has everything to do with it. Um, I mean, your love for God will make you want to do things to please God. And as long as we're doing things Gosh. for our own honor, but for him, then that's, then, then that's where you find that balance. And I think it is all about finding that balance. And it comes, and, and I guess the essence um, would be, you know, your love for God, and um, and if you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then um, anything that you do for Him um, will be from that love, and so, and that's where we find that balance there. And I do agree that there needs to be that balance there, um, instead of going to one from one extreme to the other, um, to where you're just totally just doing all these rituals and things because you, you know, that's just what you were brought up to do. And that's what you were taught to do. And then on the other extreme, you know, you can sin as much as you want and still be, you know, still be good. There has to be that balance there. Um, definitely. And, and that's very important to have that balance. Well, thank you. Thank you, Wendy. You know, one thing I pray a lot is, and I do pray that I would love God well, but I always pray first that I would receive God's love well, because I think that's where our love comes from. And so that's kind of almost, again, a priority. How do we receive God's love? And then from there, we have the capacity to love. It always initiates with him. It always starts with him. And that's, that seems to be the power of our love is receiving it, that he's given it to us so well. But the problem is not his love. The problem is my, um, my lack of receiving it. Uh, and that limits my love for him. When that happens, anybody else? Wendy, that was well said, and that helps. Anybody else? I, I'll share something. Sure. Yes, I'm. I'm just reflecting on the def definition that you're giving about spiritual formation. You said spiritual formation is not the activity to get closer to God, but receiving what God has done for us, receiving God's love. I don't consider myself that I come from a legalistic background. However, I was always taught that spiritual formation was about getting closer to God. So it was putting myself on the, as the central piece. It was about myself. It was about myself uh, growing and getting closer to God. And this this definition really makes me think and gives me a, a new perspective because when I grow and I uh, work on my spiritual formation, I don't I don't do it because I am supposed to do it. I just do it as something natural. It's not it's not a forced thing or because somebody tells me that I have to to pray or to have a relationship with God is something 
just natural that I don't even think about spiritual formation because that's part of, of my life. But this definition today just helps me to have that new, that, that new perspective. It is not about myself. It is not about myself getting closer to God, but it's, it's about recognizing and realizing what he has done for me and the love that he has for me. And I think that is so beautiful. I really do. I think that you put that so beautifully. And it does become a natural thing. If you're living in love with God, then you'll naturally do those things that please him. And it, it does become a lifestyle. And it does. And you just become a new person and your life just changes. And it just happens naturally just like that. And I love how you put that. That was very beautiful. Great. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a lot of the emphasis. You know, Romans 8 has a very strong emphasis on God is the hero, we're not. But even the life of Jesus. Um, if you notice, Jesus always pointed to the, the, the Father. And it was the Holy Spirit that pointed to Jesus in his obedience. But most of what it was talked about is just Jesus obeyed the Father. He did whatever. He was dependent upon the Father. And, uh, you know, Philippians talks about, too, talks about he gave up. He didn't grasp after being fully God. He became fully God and fully man. And uh, it's just a uh, part of the part of the emphasis as trusting God is you give over to God. And and Damaris, it just sounds like that's a very natural process that over time you've learned. And that's wonderful. It's really right on. Who else? And, you know, this is sometimes hard to express clearly. Definition of spiritual formation. What is the essence, the priority of spiritual formation? What is it not? And now, can, can I say one or two things there? Please. I want to appreciate the, the definition you gave. Then to also talk about the dimension of discipleship as part of uh, spiritual formation. Yes. Uh, my observation is that discipleship is becoming more of a program rather than process of um, having communion and intimacy with God. And I will appreciate it if you can talk a little bit more about that discipleship as part of spiritual formation so that we will not get into the root of making discipleship to be just a program, which uh, seems discipleship is turning into now. So Simon, I think it's, there's this discipleship is really almost, it's probably the same thing actually, a spiritual formation. It's about a heart following after God. Being a disciple is of Jesus Christ is having the heart that Jesus Christ had of just receiving God's love well. The problem is the word, is that the word has been used to mean a program so long that it's not a fresh word anymore. So it's, I don't think the real meaning is a, is a good meaning, but we've made it, we've taken that word and made it into a program word. And so I think what we're talking about tonight is true discipleship. But unfortunately, that word is so often meant to mean a program, a series of things you go through that are either about your head or your hands, but not your heart. And so that's why moving away to the term spiritual formation was what I was asking to do at Dallas Seminary, because the word discipleship had been misused to the point it was very hard to use that without people thinking. It was a fill-in-the-blank program. So nothing wrong with the word. It's a wonderful word. It's just has been, it's not fresh anymore. And, um, but I think it's just following, uh, just being a disciple is being spiritually formed. Does that make sense? It's about the use of the word. So, so what, what, what can be done or what should we do? Well, we decided just to use the word spiritual formation rather than discipleship. And then back around, and when people understand that, to say, this is also discipleship. But, you know, it's just hard. People, people want to control their movement toward God. And notice how I said that. They want to look back and say, I'm closer to God than you are. It's God offers us a personal relationship, but we all want to have a preferential relationship because we have sibling rivalry. So we'd say, God loves everybody, but he especially loves us Baptists because we share the gospel. Or God loves everybody, but he prefers us Pentecostals because we get excited. God loves everybody, but he prefers us Presbyterians because we have the right theology. And so we all approach God as if we are 
competing against siblings. And we use discipleship programs often to measure our ascent and we can control our movement toward God. God doesn't really want us to do that. That's rebellion. That's Brad, I'm, I'm eager to step in and join you here because so often we measure how many souls we won. And I often have to remind myself of that because while I criticize that has wrong that we're thinking that, okay, I, 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 I delivered a message and lots of people came to the altar and, you know, there's something that wrestled there. Christ brought them to the altar or my message brought them. The corollary that hits me and makes me realize that I too need to get closer, to, to understand God's closeness to me is when nobody comes. And so nobody comes and you begin to assess or is it that God didn't work? Or you get what I'm saying? So amidst all of the conversation around um, the relationship is the, the honest to goodness struggle that we still slip into measuring ourselves by our gifts. And so I'm still contemplating the question you asked me. You know, you sing and everybody said, praise the Lord, amen, and whatever. Remember, God is working through what you sang, or is it that you sang well? And, you know, where is the edge space? And what are you wrestling with in your heart? Because if we admit that there are very few perfect folks around here, then we know that there are individual stuff that we wrestle with, so we have to keep remembering that he knows our hearts and he understands these wrestles, and the sooner we acknowledge them and keep reminding ourselves. This is why I keep talking about this conversation, this communion, which is like momentarily, because you're constantly in a, and that to me is a spiritual formation, this wrestling where you're getting to understand who he is, so I need not wrestle. Very good. Very well said. Thank you. Very good. That, that, it is attention. Anybody else? Anything that this has jumped at you? Disagree? Would like to state something more clear? Have a story. I, I um, have, I think I'm just processing this. Um, I, I'd like to say that I am jumping in with both feet, but I'm, I'm, I'm just spinning on a number of different issues and I'll throw them out there. People can comment back or you can comment them back or, but um, Sometimes in our conversations, I, I, I feel like we are switching labels on, on our actions or activities. Um, so we, we talk a lot about, it seems like we talk a lot about, you know, we just follow the Father. We see what the Father is doing. We follow him there. We join him there. But then in our other conversations, we say, we, we set up this hypothetical conversation with God where we say, God, what do you want me to do? I want to follow you, I want to be where you are. And he looks back at us and says, I don't know, what do you want to do? Um, so I'm, I'm struggling to mate those two conversations and how they work together. Um, I don't want, I mean, I love my boys and I want them to follow God, but I don't want them hanging around me all day long, parroting what I do. Uh, they're different. And... Um, I, I, I have the sense that sometimes if they're following God, God may lead them to places where it really doesn't look like the father's involved in that location at all. Um, there's nothing going on there. So I, I, I'm just kind of spinning on this, this sort of dualism in the conversation that I sense from time to time. Um, I, I like the idea of saying we don't have to do anything 
Um, clearly the New Testament is about doing a great deal. Um, so how do we get those in the right order? How do we make sure on this point that we're not reflecting culture because our culture today is, at least in America, is all about giving everybody a trophy and a smiling face and affirming how very much and special they are. And out of that uh, operating principle, go live your life. And then they, they smack into employment in the real world and it doesn't work like that. You know, nobody gives a flip what you think of yourself. There's work to do um, in some companies. Um, I, I also I also am just processing this in terms of where I find it in scripture. So where I find Jesus dealing with his disciples in this way, where I find um, not in the not in not in the theological elements of the epistles, but in the in the application elements of the epistles. Where do I find this? So James one and two is one thing. James four is another. The language is very harsh there, very clear. Weep, howl, uh, lament. Um, James didn't say to them, I want you guys to picture how much God loves you. Um, he said, I am going to make, I'm going to light a fire in you. You need to be miserable. Mm -hmm. And you move close to God and God will move close to you. Um, so I'm, I'm just spinning on that a little bit. On the other hand, I am, I am thinking about how Jesus dealt with Peter and I, after his denial. And I, I've, I've said from time to time, in my preaching and teaching, I, I said, I don't know what you think the biggest sin might be, but I have a sense that the, that the biggest sin you can commit is to be right in the presence of Jesus and just deny him. I, I think there's something foundational about that, and everything else grows out of that. And so I think what Peter did in denying the Christ the night of his crucifixion was, was really, really a hot mess. and. Um, and yet, what we see in Jesus' treatment of Peter tends to model this. He tends to say, Peter, I'm going to ask you some questions. Um, I'm not really doing this to rub your nose in it. I just want to be clear. I want us to be clear that um, I'm not going to crucify you for this. I'm actually going to commission you out of this. Um, so I, 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 you know, I smell part of this theology in, in that. Um, I, I've always liked the idea that our faith is fundamentally a faith of simply passing on what we've received. And we don't invent stuff as Christians. We pass on what we've been given. If you haven't been given anything, you don't have anything to pass on. So receiving that love seems foundational in, in passing it on to others. Um, I'm also thinking as I, as I consider how these different scriptures sometimes seem to spin in opposite directions, that sometimes the answer is yes, meaning there is a paradox in some of these great truths. Mm -hmm. And sometimes Jesus needs us to do what your spiritual director showed you how to do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the answer is I need to show you a different side of this equation. That God is, has made himself, has revealed himself to us, but that doesn't mean he's simple. Um, and, and, then, so, and, and then I'm also thinking about spiritual formation within the greater Catholic mindset. In terms of grace coming to you through the sacrament, um, I, I don't think they process grace at a fundamental level quite like a Protestant would. So there's, there's a bit of a disconnect there. Um, and I apologize, I'm not uh, putting all this together. I, I, it's just kind of where my head is at. So I thought I'd lean into the conversation and say, those are the things I'm spinning on. And um, if you have a nice five word phrase to tie all that together, I'm open to it. But that's just kind of where I am. I don't. And I think what I appreciate you've done is you've thrown out a lot of questions and I can't answer those and I don't think anybody can, but it creates a great conversation. And that's where we're at a doctoral level, we're at a master's level. These are, these are conversations we should have. I would say for me, it's about priorities. And no matter what, the biggest priority is God has made me his, uh, his son, fellow heir of Jesus Christ. I have an identity that nothing can 
can take away. And yet, even in that identity, I sometimes need to be challenged. I need to be pushed. I need to be disciplined. There's all kinds of things I need to do. It doesn't add to that identity. And when I think it does, I am rebelling against God. But even though I, that is the reality, I'm a fully adopted heir with Jesus Christ. He delights in me because of what he's done for me. But there's all kinds of things I do to keep from employing that, believing that, acting upon that. And this is where we have to challenge each other. But I don't see it as a balance. I see it as a priority. That is the ultimate truth. Under that, though, there's some things we need to do as a result of it. And when we start looking at ourselves as the hero, we've probably gotten out of the priority. Um, and that's, that's, I think, the point. Um, so one of the things, I'm going to move forward, but I think it starts addressing your question. One of the things that spiritual formation tries to do is to create habits and community and processes to help us to address our cynicism of God's character as displayed in our emotions and in our heart. Maybe not in our head, but in our heart, in our actions, in our emotions. All of us are sinning. Why is that? Because we're just in some ways believing we have our own best interest in mind. And so what ends up happening is, um, and this is where it goes into a little bit of a, a counseling conversation, but it doesn't have to. But um, there's a guy who uh, helped us put together our spiritual promotion program at Dallas Seminary, a guy named Larry Crabb. So I spent a lot of time with him. And uh, one of the things he said that I think makes sense is when you, can, you have a behavior and you can't seem to change that behavior no matter how hard you try, most likely the goal of that behavior is hidden from you. Let me just think about this. If you have a behavior and you can't seem to change that behavior, no matter how hard you try, the real goal of that behavior is hidden from you. And so what Jonathan Owens, a Puritan, would say is to deal with that. He talked about mortification of, the, of sin and vivification, which is his phrasing. It's about finding the root cause of your sin. And what is the real root cause of that? And so what counselors sometimes will do is they say, you have a narrative, a narrative that's come from your background, from your family background, from issues and circumstances. And there's a narrative that you're almost unaware of that's saying something to you. And that's causing you to act inconsistent with what you know is true. Because that narrative, a false narrative, a wrong narrative, becomes more true to you than uh, what real truth is. So we would look at scripture and say, God loves us. Nothing can separate it from the love of God. But yet there's something in our narrative as a child, rejected perhaps by parents, rejected by a spouse, difficulties. And you, there's a narrative that says, I'm unlovable or I'm afraid. And, and the way the counselors will do it is they have you know, different, they say feelings drive us. And again, I'm not going to go into counseling theory and say it's, it's it, but it's a way to have the conversation. Uh, but they would say, Generally, we will have one or two strong feelings. It could be fear that drives us, anger, pain, guilt, shame, or loneliness. And a lot of that comes from background. And so, again, a legalistic background. Um, I have a shame part of that. And so I have a narrative. And just, so if you look at me and you go, oh, Brad, that's a green shirt. There's a part of me that because of my background and my narrative, I would go, oh, What's wrong with my shirt? I guess it's not the right shirt to wear. Now, I'm unaware of this, and I've become aware of it. And so there's this kind of a weird reaction that that's just not real. You didn't. You just said it's a green shirt. That's all it should be. And yet all of us will have something inside of us that will take something and move it to a place of fear, shame, guilt, loneliness. And so what happens is sometimes that gets in the way of our spiritual formation because those false narratives get in the way. So we say God fully loves us. Uh, he delights in us. He calls us to obedience. And yet what's ending up happening is the reason we're not obeying is that narrative is saying, no, I'm unlovable. Or no, I really must work myself out of my guilt or my shame. Or you know what? God says he loves me, but I never see him. I feel lonely because I'm always separate. I'm always having to earn my way into finding camaraderie or whatever with him or connection with him. A lot of that obviously comes from parental experience painful circumstances and so one aspect of spiritual formation is the conversation about what are some false and wrong narratives we have that cause us to do the very thing we know is not right not the right thing to do 
and it's again Romans 7, but I can go into why that's connected, or causes us to hurt the very people we desire to love. And I think all of us know there are things we do that we don't want to do, but yet we do them. And there's times that we hurt the very people we want to love the most. We all experience that. So then we ask the question, why? What is causing that? And one of the ways to do that in community is to say, is there some things that my head is saying that are false and wrong narratives that are causing that for me to not totally be aware of what I know is true and not playing that out? Now that gets complicated, of course. And this is where um, really understanding our story in a, in a grace-filled way and in community helps us to begin to understand kind of where God is working in us and to be able to share that at that level. Now, again, I'm not saying counseling is a solution any more than Jonathan Owens as a Puritan would say mortification of the flesh, which was kind of his version in, you know, the, in earlier centuries. But it is something we need to be aware of. We have false narratives about who God is and who we are. We're born with them. They're shaped in our environment. And part of our job to understand our calling is to realize what they are and how we begin to deal with them. And that's going to be in conversation. That's going to be in openness. Um, because as we are experiencing our calling, understanding our gifts is a way to connect to our calling, but also understanding false narratives are a way that we can connect with our calling because often it's those false narratives that are keeping us from fully realizing what God has designed and called us to do. So that's a mouthful. Um, anybody, anybody respond to that? Questions, concerns, way well, you would say that better than I would, or just another way of saying it. Or like, wow, I don't have no idea what you just said. How would you respond to that? The heart is exceedingly deceitful. Who can know it? That's really basically what I'm saying. And yet in a community, we can begin that process of learning, learning that, the community of grace. How would you say that? Who's been on a journey, perhaps in a counseling journey or in a spiritual formation community journey to begin to understand that? Well, at the risk of speaking again, I have uh, probably 12 years or so ago, I had a, a guy I just met and uh, we were getting to know each other and I was sitting in, in this little prayer shed that I had in my, my old house and um, I'd gotten to trust him enough to where I could relay some things that were going on in my life and I had just had a a huge fight with my wife and um, I was totally confused by this fight. I just couldn't figure out what was going on. And I just, I felt shame and I felt all kinds of stuff. And so I was trying to describe this to him and, and uh, he, he said to me, so do you, you want to be free of that? And I looked at him and I said, what? He says, well, your wife just said something to you and you, you read it through these lenses that you completely you basically said you got triggered something inside of you got triggered that had no bearing on what she was actually saying to you. Um, and so he started to teach me about what you just said, lie based thinking. There's a narrative going on in me. And um, so I don't know if you guys have ever heard of theophostic prayer ministry, but that's basically theophostic just means God's light. And the process is simply just facilitating a, Holy, a, a conversation between you and the Holy Spirit and using emotion as a, as a language to get back to the root of a lie that you believe. And the, the crazy, amazing experience that I had with them was going back to my very first day in boarding school as a 12-year-old. And... Um, I had just been basically dumped by my parents in this place. I, I use the word dumped because that's what it felt like at the time. And they left and I was this insecure 12 year old who's now suddenly stuck into a dormitory with 20 other kids, who boys that I didn't know. And I ran away. I ran to my grandparents' house who lived up the hill and my grandmother just loaded me back in the car and took me back. And I had completely forgotten about this event, but 
this conversation and this prayer session I had with this guy took me back to that night where I was lying in my dormitory bed, feeling completely alone, feeling completely abandoned. And this little voice says in my head, see, nobody wants you. And that narrative, I lived in that narrative for 30 years after that. It shaped so much of my life. It shaped, yeah, I mean, I could write a book on how much of my life was shaped by that little voice that said to me, nobody wants you. And all the elaborate mechanisms that I developed to be wanted and to survive all of that stuff. And to hear God speak truth into that place um, began to unravel this whole mechanism that I'd built up to survive the pain of that that lie that was told to me so <clears throat> i think what you're what you're talking about is such an incredible amazing process that god can take us through to set us free from those things and find the freedom um that to to stop doing certain things to stop reacting in certain ways and i will I will describe an event that actually happened today. One of the guys I work with made a really stupid mistake. I mean, it, it's probably a thousand dollar mistake uh, mm. in terms of waste of materials, waste of time. And, and I had clearly communicated to him um, and it was in the drawings, how big and how tall this thing needed to be built. And I, he called me up and said, Hey, I, I screwed this up does it need to be this tall? And I said, yeah, it does. And I said, have you looked at the drawings? And he said, yeah, I looked at the drawings again and that's how tall it's meant to be. And, and I, was, I was a little angry because, I mean, that's a very expensive mistake. And um, anyway, later on I came home and, to the shop and he was downstairs and he, he was just really upset because he was trying to fix this thing now. And I could tell that he was just beating himself up. And I felt such compassion for him in that moment because he was beating himself up about it. And right then and there, I just had this incredible opportunity to pour grace on him um, and to just say to him, don't judge yourself right now. Stop. Stop beating yourself up. How's that working out for you? He says, well, no, it's not working out real well. And I said, you know what? I've made the same mistake so many more times than you have. And, and every time I beat myself up about it, it just makes it worse. So, so stop. It's okay. Don't worry about it. And you know what? If you need to just take 10 minutes, go sit on the deck and just come back to a place of peace. Well, I went back into the shop later and there he was fixing this whole, whole different attitude. He's at peace. And I just thought, wow, what an opportunity to extend grace. But I know that several years ago, my reaction to that was, a, was completely different. It was condemning. It was frustration. It was anger. It was, oh, you're going to have to pay for it now. And, um, to see where God has brought me to, to where, where I look forward to opportunities to offer grace like that um, because of what I've experienced him offering me um, every time I interact with him, when I screw things up, um, you know, I, I knew in the past that I should be offering grace right now, but, but everything inside of me was full of anger and frustration. Um, but as he's dealt with the stuff in my own heart and continues to, it's just an ongoing process. It, it becomes natural for me to offer grace rather than, than the opposite. And I think that, to me, shows the, the, the fruit of Holy Spirit at work um, in, in taking us to the roots of those places where we're broken and, and bringing healing so that we live differently, not because we're trying to, but because we can't really help it. That's well said. And you notice it's not tolerance. There is a standard for how that thing has to be built. Right. 
that you didn't you didn't say it's not tolerance, but grace is saying, I give you grace in the midst of a true mistake. I've named this mistake. But right. you can't offer grace until you re- begin to receive it. Right. That yeah. says yeah. more we'll about it your... again. Right. What? And it's probably gonna cost you something. Yeah. But don't beat yourself up about it. Just go do it. It's it's the human condition. We we make major mistakes a lot. But you're saying something to him that you've already heard from God. Yeah. And God's been saying to it your whole life, you're receiving it now in a way that you can also extend it. So it's a great story. And that is a spiritual formation story at its heart. So Kurt has done. I'm sorry. Thank you for sharing that story. That was, that was a great story. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. I agree. Can I, can I just say something to Anthony real quick? Anthony, I am so, so glad that you shared. I saw you turn your mic on earlier and I, I was going to go, I turned mine on because I was going to ask you to share because what you shared is so, all of those questions, I wrestle with those same things. You know, the idea of, I want to do what you're doing, God. And then he says to me, well, what would you like to do? It, it's not either or, it's both and. Um, so many of those opposite things that you were talking about i experience um and and i and i wrestle with them but like brad said i keep coming back to that 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 one foundational place and that is he's done it he's he has everything that i need he's given me everything i need he he's forgiven everything that i'll ever do and i've ever done but I'm a worker. I, I've got to work. I, I get up in the morning and and I'm going, okay, God, what are we doing? Let's let's go do it. And I go charging out there and I do stuff. And then there's times when I find, oh, I've just been wasting my time. And then there's other times when I find that I have been doing what he's up to. And so it's never, I never get it right. It doesn't seem to matter to get it right anymore. It's just the, the incredible experience I get to learn from the process. And that's what I said to this guy today. I said, you know, if you keep making this mistake every time we build a set of cabinets, sure. I'm going to have some problems with that. But you, you probably aren't because right now what you're feeling and what you're experiencing is going to, you're going to think twice before you build another cabinet like this again and measure twice before you cut, cut the, the really expensive pieces of wood that went into making it. And so it, it becomes this opportunity to to grow and and be wiser and make better choices and measure twice, cut once. That's it. So, Kurt, any thoughts you have on this? Kurt's done some thinking on this. Plus, I like the lights. That's kind of cool. It's a Jesus light thing. <laughs> I need all the help I can get. Can you hear me okay? I can. Very well, yes. As I said in, a, I think, one of the first meetings, I think this is a critical course. I know it was for me when I took my doctoral course here, and I just want to encourage you in it, both in the readings you're doing and in the work that it's requiring you to dig through. So I'm going to give an example of the importance of spiritual formation through maybe narrative. But I grew up on this song that maybe you've heard, love is, is something if you give it away, give it away, give it away, you know, love is something. If you give it away, you'll end up having more. That was the theology I grew up on. Now that sounds just right to, to many people. Now I want to bring it to adulthood. And, you know, I am educated. I am out doing God's work. I've been walking with the Lord for decades. And there's this guy that comes to my life that ends up just creates havoc in my life Uh, but he holds a lot of power in my circles Uh, he's doing damage to me and my family and i'm just like after this time i just tried to work it out and i go god and then this is going to sound you know possibly very immature and maybe it was but it was where i was i said god i need to confess I've tried to love this guy. I've done this action of love. I've done this action of love. I've done this action of love. I've forgiven him this many times. I need to tell you, I don't love him. You know, and God, I've given it away. I've given this love away. I've given this love away. I've got no more love to give this guy. 
and so I come to you. Okay, so that's when God was just smiling very large at me and goes, well, good. I don't need you to have love for him. I've got love for him. And that's all you need. And you need me to give you my love for him. Here's the thing that I found in my narrative. Because I was raised in a works mentality. I thought I was to be a love manufacturer. That I manufacture love. I manufacture forgiveness. I manufacture these things. I didn't, I mean, I know not to be works oriented. I, I had moved into, I had need, I know I need grace, but it was so deeply embedded in me to, that I needed to create these things. Little did I know I was trying to behave like the creator. And so this is an example of when narrative really helped me as I was digging into these things to realize I still needed to grow and a very critical understanding of God. And it's what Brad started us out with as far as spiritual formation. It is the receiving of God's love. It is the receiving of God's grace and then working it out. Now, here's what I want to apply it to in, in our lives and like what your gift set is. We can get into this thing of I need to dig, 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 dig and find, you know, what it is that what are my talents what are my gifts and all these kind of things and once again that sounds right except i want to just put this little twist of like what god revealed to me we need to look at what god's been putting into us from the moment he created us what has he been directing and he leading when you start looking for those god movements in your life which which is what the whole course is directing us to then you start to find that true identity that he's given our culture would have us create an identity. That's one of the deceptions. What this class helps you do is not create your own identity, but find the identity the creator has given you and has been pouring into you and revealing to you over time through the activities of your life, through the passions he's put into you, so on and so forth. That's good. Good, thank you for clarifying that. I'm a little aware of our time, and Marcel, I don't let anybody go quiet, and so just any comments or thoughts that you have, uh, you've got the best the collection of books behind you, so it doesn't have to be wise, but <laughs> you've got the background for it. <laughs> you know, Dr. Brad, um, I really find you to be an interesting person. <laughs> <laughs> interesting Very. is not always good. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like a good teacher, I I I had a feeling that you might you might pick on me um, okay. because I, I was so silent for the night. I was just trying to uh, to assimilate, uh, to uh, you know reflect, interpret um, some of the things that that would have been said um, over the session. But I actually had to read this book. This is yours. Okay, sure. You uh, have to, yeah, it's required. <laughs> in Fresno with uh, Dr. Randy White. Mm-hmm. Um, this was one of the books that I did uh, uh, a review, book review on. And I am on page uh, 151, um, where um, you said the goal of spiritual formation is to increase our trust and the dependence on God as the deepest, deepest motives of our heart. And uh, I think um, that is so profound um, to me in terms of, you know, what we are doing. And if I had to, to, to describe it, I would, I would like to say it includes some of our life experiences spiritually that, that help us to really develop that trust in God. Um, I think someone on the program talked about good and bad experiences. I think even some of the bad experiences also help you to, to really draw close to God. I could speak for my own self because I, I remember um, some experiences I, I've had work related and so on. When you know, sometimes when things are going good, you, you feel a sense that you're there, you arrived and so on until the heat is turned up. And then you recognize that you don't have the power. You can't, you know, back off all of your enemies. And so I think it's the psalmist said, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock. <laughs> that is higher than high. So 
Um, I've had those experiences, so I believe that some of the the, the, the good and the bad experiences that, that we have in life, those things um, help to form or help to form us spiritually. I am very cognizant of the fact that while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. And so there is nothing that we could do or we, we could have done to merit that, that, that grace, which is unmerited favor. Um, Jesus paid it all for us. And therefore, um, I don't believe no amount of work, um, no amount of prayer. Um, you know, you can't impress God because God is God. And, and that is my, my, my view. Um, I, I am also cognizant of the fact that, um, that sometimes um, I'm also careful that these things like prayer, um, fellowshipping with brethren, uh, some of the things that you've mentioned here, um, while we should not, you know, try to use these things to draw closer to God, I think we should be mindful also that those things um, will help us to help to keep us sane and to keep us on track. I remember when I was going up for credentials, there's a doctrine which, which is referred to as eternal security. Right. And this doctrine of eternal security basically states that once you're saved, you're always saved. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is erroneous. And therefore, um, one should not use these uh, areas to draw closer to God, but one should also recognize the importance, to my mind, of those things because they help to keep a level of sanity in relation to your salvation and how God wants you to operate. But we can't impress God by our prayers. You remember the scribes and the Pharisees? <laughs> they went into the streets as a pack of pretenders. As a matter of fact, some of the greatest pretenders, uh, you know, you, 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 don't, you, you don't really know their... They, only God knows their hearts. And so I don't want to be like a scribe and a Pharisee. I remember there are times, I think there's a song that we sing which talks about the Holy Spirit searching us. And uh, I, I think I know what are some of, my, some of my, my, my problems and some of my issues. And I think that's a good position to be in because if you don't know um, what are some of your problems or some of the issues or traits that you have that might interfere with you and your relationship with God, I, don't, I think that uh, that's not, you are not in a good place. And it is not just knowing to my mind, but attempting to do something about it because people could know and they don't want to do anything about it. So I believe and trust in God. And I think testimonies are, so when you look and you see what God has done for you, you recognize, you know, when I look back where I came from, a poor neighborhood, my father, um, a carpenter, my mother hadn't, hadn't no education and so on. And uh, I could only attest and attribute, you know, where I've come from to where I am today in God, to, to God. Because I don't know of any amount of education, I don't know of any amount of money, of any status or position could really, you know, cement your place with what God wants you to do. It has to be God. So I, I, am, I am living by that, um, that view. And uh, I, I, I admire the, 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 the theme that you said, the goal of spiritual formation is to increase our trust in God. I think that's, that's why we want to be formed spiritually, so that we could understand that we must spend time trusting God, because that, he's the only way. I, I don't know of any other way. You know, that's my uh, contribution. Well, thank you. Thank you for letting me call on you. You had, you had stored up a good contribution, so thank you for that. So we're not saying that the spiritual disciplines are something you don't do. It's just do them with the right motive and the right priority. And as Andrew had described, you know, he's now returning to them with a certain joy. Um, and if we're not finding joy in them, if we think we're, we're obligated, then at some point we need to stop and say, Jesus, help me. God, help me. Because I don't think my heart is right in this. Help me to change my heart. So, but well said. Yvonne, I'm going to hand it back to you. You can do whatever you want to. Um, Anthony's given us a whole bunch of questions. And so we have more questions at the end than we did at the beginning. And that's good. Um, nothing wrong with that, but hopefully that will allow some good conversation. So, Yvonne, thank you. Thank you too, Brad. Thank you for stirring in us all those questions and, and letting me recognize that I need to learn 
even more how to relate my gifts to my spiritual formation because that has left me thinking real hard. Uh, Anthony, I thank you for those questions too. Each week we ask you to comment on surprises or disagreements or comments on the Zoom room. And I'm expecting and anticipating that you will ignite that conversation, Anthony. Because what the, the, the issues you threw there, and I, I was relieved when I reckoned in my spirit that God did not expect us to have all the answers. <laughs> but I know that this communion with him is the place we get to when we say, Daddy, I need to understand, and I know you are my teacher. So I'm um, going to invite you to drop those questions in too. Um, if ever you can articulate them a second time and let us all um, reflect on them and any other thoughts you may have relating to uh, the Zoom room. We're going to talk, begin to talk soon about our group presentations, which is really just your beginning to think of a 10 minute PowerPoint presentation of your final project, where you will attempt in your group to synthesize that in a way that you can deliver it in the shortest possible time with the shortest amount of PowerPoints, your main thoughts. So you begin to put that together and soon you'll be asked to meet. I think this week you're being asked to schedule a time and next week you will be asked to meet with your group and begin to just do that dry run, to hear from each other because we're growing out of each other's experience and we are attempting to sometimes reshape our understanding of ourselves and of our world as we listen to each other. Okay, are there any questions coming out of this evening that have not yet been answered? Is there anything, any last word, anything from anyone? No. Well, I thank you so much, Brad. I, I don't know how I will stop asking you to do <laughs> these sessions and in particular spiritual formation. I pray you strength and I ask God to preserve you for this purpose for us. Um, we've benefited immensely from this evening. I'm sure we all have and we've left with food for thought. So thank you. Kurt, I know you're there. Could you just close us out in prayer, if you don't mind, please? I don't see him still there. He may He's have already gone. Left. He's gone. Okay. So I am going to ask your last speaker. I'm going to ask the officer of education, Marcel. Could you close us out, please? Father, we give you praise and we give you thanks. We thank you for this experience that we've had tonight where we could have shared ideas and learned from one another. I pray God that you'll continue to impact our lives so that we will really be transformational and we will become real agents of change. We thank you that you will touch each and every one of us tonight. I thank you that you'll strengthen us, you'll energize us, and you'll continue to cause us to march on. We thank you for our professors and all those who have been contributing to this program. I pray that you will bless them. Even as we go, I thank you for a good night's rest, good evening's rest, good morning's rest. And we pray that you will continue to keep us in the all of your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Marcel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you in particular, Simon, if you've not yet left. Bless you all and have a good rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you.